It is said that in this world we have sheep and herders, owners and workers, leaders and followers. And I'm certain everyone watching this video are leaders, even me, right? Yeah. Well, let me give you an example. You just witnessed a terrible performance of a play at your local theater, but everyone around you is giving a standing ovation. Curtain call. What do you do? Well, science says that you'll most likely stand up and start clapping, despite not wanting to stand up, let alone clap. So today, I'm talking about the neuroscience of conformity. But before I do, subscribe to my channel if you want to learn more about that thing in your head. No, not that song from the 80s about never giving someone up or letting them down. Haha, <laughs> you just got rickrolled. Wait, is that still relevant? But the brain. <laughs> Social influence includes changing someone else's beliefs, actions, and attitudes through social interactions. There are three essential pillars or ways in which these changes can occur. Conformity, obedience, and compliance. Often there's an interplay between all three of these pillars of social influence. And I'm just going to be focusing on conformity, because conformity is not a cut and dry process, as it can be both automatic and thought through, both well-reasoned and completely contradictory, and both essential for society, but can also inhibit or stifle society. When we talk about conformity, what we're really talking about is behaving in a way that allows you to fit in with a group, group belonging. And often, when you find yourself belonging to one group, you find yourself a misfit in relation to another group. A pretty clear example of this is exemplified in the stereotypical American teenager experience. As you are growing, attempting to find a perceived individual identity, you are often coalescing with your friends in your own age group, wearing the same clothes, listening to the same music, speaking in a very similar fashion. You're conforming but you're also rebelling against established rules defined by your parents and other adults. Because like, I'm so big mad right now, my parents just don't understand my low-key obsession with popular music group. So I can't secure the bag to like go to the concert. So I'm stuck in my room just listening to my jams or whatever the kids are saying these days. Anyways, so while you're conforming as a teenager to fit in with your particular social group, you are most likely being a non-conformist in relation to another group, maybe that of your parents and grandparents. So conforming is crucial for group belonging, but conformity serves an essential purpose beyond this, and that is our need for consistency. For instance, whether we wait in line at the post office, or wait in line to get from the classroom to the cafeteria, or even find ourselves in traffic jams, aka vehicle lines, well, I spend the majority of my life waiting in lines. What kind of life is that? Existential crisis aside, there is conformity in creating lines. One human body, presumably alive, in front of another human body and another. We are nearly assured we will get our package sent when at the post office, we'll get to the cafeteria to eat lunch, or we'll make it to work eventually once we make it through these lines. This kind of consistency is not exclusive to creating some level of predictability. It can also be used to create consistency in a shared identity. As an instance of this, consider the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance. This is learned at a very early age, and it was installed in the US educational system as a means of creating a sense of what some may call patriotism. Interestingly, both expressions of conformity do tend to identify the groups to which you belong. There was a huge increase in research about conformity in the 1950s when researchers discovered that people were heavily influenced by the judgments of others despite having clear evidence that group opinion was wrong. For instance, in a study examining length of lines, when told by others in the group that an obviously shorter line was longer than an obviously longer line, study participants would select the clearly wrong line one third of the time. Studies examining conformity have only gotten even more sophisticated since the 1950s, and they tend to lead to the same conclusions. Some studies have even focused on people's ability to predict whether they'll conform to the group or not. In these cases, most people aren't as good at being a free spirit as they think and people tend to think that they're better non-conformists than they actually tend to be. Before I get into how to influence others when you hold the unpopular opinion, I want to highlight how the swift and easy willingness to conform to popular opinion, despite it being so clearly incorrect in these cases, has made a reasonable argument that conformity can be a somewhat automatic process. 
This may be due to the reliance on heuristics, which are mental shortcuts that allow you to make judgments that are created through trial and error style learning. This is also seen in brain imaging studies. Now, where are we located today? Ah, the nucleus accumbens, an area associated with automatic reward processing, was shown to be more active during times of conformity. So this all lends evidence towards conformity as an automatic process, but in what instances is it less automatic and more deliberate? This is where the nonconformist, with their unpopular opinion of enjoying mayonnaise with peanut butter, enters the scene. This opinion can come into conflict with the majority's lunch practice, where everyone conforms by eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. People in the majority have been shown to conform to minority influence when the opposing viewpoint is noticeable, thereby demanding attention. Just as a side note here, this is why social movements gain traction when they are consistent and noticeable, rather than invisible. So while the nucleus accumbens is associated with the automatic nature of conformity, a place we venture to now for the more deliberate process of non-conformity is the medial prefrontal cortex. This area is associated with conflict monitoring and was shown to be more active during instances of non-conformity. So the brain understands that there's some kind of conflict at work and so it seeks to make adjustments. Thus, brain imaging studies highlight both ideas of the automatic and deliberate nature of social influence. The way in which minority influence creates the deliberate process is by forcing the majority to better understand and, at the very least, think about their own conforming behaviors. Thus, the minority is forcing the majority into de-automating, I think I just invented a new word, you're welcome internet, their conforming behaviors that come into conflict with the minority group. After all is said and done, it's worth noting here that conformity is a natural and automatic process within our brains, and that non-conformity takes some real thought. This is why, with the right visibility, new ideas and actions can form even when the vast majority of people think only one way. So why did I focus on one of our pillars of social influence, that of conformity? Well, it is important to understand how you can, and often do, influence others. But, and maybe even more importantly, it is crucial to understand how others are enacting their influence over you. If you liked what you watched, subscribe to my channel and share with family and friends. Also make sure to hit that like button. Also, also, if you want to support my channel with big brainiac energy, then head on over to my Patreon page to become a contributing member. And as always, thank you for feeding your brain with free brain snacks.